your goal. And as you increase the angle, you can see the poundage going out. So until finally at a 60 degree angle, you have about 60 pounds of weight shearing off at that verbal load. So head position is pretty important. Just with your average head. Okay. Oh, goals for today. Well, there they are. I'm not going to go over the clinical anatomy and do that in the lab next week. It's a resource I strongly suggest you take advantage of. Here we hope to get through everything. I will talk about origins and insertions a bit. These are the kind of figures you'll see in more red and blue. That's what the markings are on the skeleton. Uh, historically, it's important to know origin and insertion. If you look at Moore's book, choosing proximal and distal attachment. That's what we care about. I don't really care if you know proximal and distal, just that you know the attachments of both muscles. But you may find it helpful when you look at a blue line here or a red, red surface there, and you go, okay, that's the infraspinatus muscle attachment. That's where it starts. So where does it go? And then you find a blue dot somewhere else, and you go, okay, that's beginning and end of a muscle. So although it's hopeful and helpful, I'll never ask you from again for origin insertion. I just want to know if you know the attachment. But you'll see the red and blue in the skeletons, and you'll see it throughout more, but he never uses the word origin insertion. Well, sometimes in the text it does. But in the tables, it's all distal and proximal attachment. So that's all you need to know. Because uh, the queen, I was going to say croaked, because the king, queen has passed away, and in this anti colonial movement and you know everything, what are we doing? Canceling school next Monday. You can clap if you want. I know, right? You're all colonialists. There you are. You're supporting the monarchy. Anyway. There won't be a lecture. So there are a few fine words taken in the Queen's name by me last night when I realized I lost 50 more minutes with you. And I have to now distribute that over the remaining lectures for the upper limb so we can be done in time for the midterm. So I will triage some stuff, but not a lot. And I'll probably talk pretty fast. Okay? And you can thank the Queen and the Premier for that one. Okay? Uh, so no class. That means the L1A labs are canceled too. So next week, if you're on the Monday lab, you're free to go to any of the other labs. I strongly recommend it so we don't fall behind. Because shortly you're going to have another Monday off with Thanksgiving. At least I didn't teach a three hour Monday night class. <laughs> Just say what? Well, next term, and this course, three hours Monday night. That way, so three lectures done. A week of content would have gone out the door on the whim of that. So these are the page numbers we're going to be discussing. A lot of questions, a lot of emails, what do we need to know, i.e. what's testable. You should know everything, that's what you're paying your tuition for. But the second part is, do I need to know this if you're going to ask me to tell So one of your figures last time was this, from view of the skull. What did I say? You have to know all the bones, right? So I pointed here, you know that's the mandible, maxillary, the zygoma, the frontal, and you know them from this view. But you know the boxes here. There's some blue highlighted things, and a lot of stuff that's not been highlighted. Highlighted ones, partially for cueing me. So I talked about the knees on the glabella, what the hell the calvera was, especially these concave, because some of them belonged in death white, and the inferior one is its own bone. I needed to draw that out in the lecture, hence why it's highlighted. Okay. So for this slide, that's what's important to take home. Sometimes you see something like this. No boxes. Nothing. It means I talked about everything on that page, or will, in the future. So we mentioned everything about what was important on this thing, because we then went on and talked about the mandible. Okay. Another slide we're going to pick up today. And usually I try to review a bit at the beginning of each lecture. We'll see how much I can do now that I've lost 50 minutes. Here, you see absolutely no blue boxes. Why? Is every single point on this slide has been addressed in the lecture, or will be. So they're important landmarks you need to know. Now sometimes on a, on a slide, I won't point out anything. The first very frontal coronal, uh, coronal view of the skull, I just said mandible. And then later on I show you the whole thing, right? So obviously there may be cases where a slide doesn't point at something, but you can pretty well guarantee down the road I may. If I point at it anywhere in a lecture, it must be somehow important. So use that as a guide to help you. 
These blue boxes, here of a dislocated temporal mandibular joint, these are clinical vignettes that are scattered throughout more, 30 pages. I will never ask you something on a blue page. That's for interest sake only. Remember the basal fractures and the skull fractures? Go to the blue page, just to keep you interested. I'll never ask you what a basal fracture is, a linear fracture, compression fracture. But it might be nice to know, okay? So, picking up where we left off, this is a cross, this is your temporal mandibular joint. Remember, it's got a capsule, fibrous capsule, thick collagen. In fact, part of it, of the lateral ligament, is really thick, and that's an example of an intrinsic ligament. It's literally built into the capsule. The way the collagen's laid down, it's on a certain angle. You can see the line here, it's sort of there to help prevent the jaw from dislocating to some extent. It's not that strong. You cut it away, you can see into the temporal mandibular joint. So there's the head and the neck of the, of the, of the mandible, or the condylar process. Here's the head and neck again over this image. So that articulates through a disc with this fossa, the mandibular fossa, okay? And so the disc sits in between it. It's got two bands, an anterior band and a, and a posterior band kind of makes the thing, rather than just a flat carpet, it gives it a front ridge and a back ridge to it. And the head sort of sits in between these. So they grooves. They're built up parts of the tissue. And that whole capsule separates the two bones and the two spaces, the superior one and the inferior one, are filled with fluid, making it a synovial joint. And it's called a modified hinge joint. Why? Because when you're just flapping your gums, opening your jaw about an inch, it's a hinge joint. We get full depression of the jaw, send the jaw completely down and open, and it's called the three finger rule. You put three fingers in there. To get the last two inches, the whole head slides down on the surface and brings the disc with it. Okay. Think of it as you're moving a fridge, buddy's gonna move the fridge, but it's on a carpet and you're pulling the carpet. Okay. That's what the disc does. It helps by pulling forward, and then allowing this to drop down. Question? Uh, a modified hinge, according to Moore. So it's a hinge joint, uh, but you'll see that just kind of quasi-violated the fact that it's just a pure hinge joint, because it actually moves, the joint separates to some extent. And clinically, if you go too far, then the head pops up over the top of the anterior tubercle, and that's a dislocation. Okay, so I point to a muscle here. This is, we're gonna go next to talk about the four, and the only ones you have to know for the skull at this point, you, for four muscles of mastication. But there's the lateral pterygoid muscle, there's a superior head and an inferior head. And the superior head, as it comes back, it actually inserts into that cartilage disc. That's what it attaches to. Whereas the bigger inferior head actually attaches onto the neck of, of the mandible itself. So it's attaching right near to the joint on the bone, and the superior part actually is grabbing the disc. Interesting design. If this contracts the superior part, what's it going to do? It's going to pull the disc forward. If the inferior part contracts, what's it going to do? It's going to pull the head forward. So this muscle is critical in getting those last two inches of depression of the jaw because it causes this what's called translation, the gliding of the head down the inferior tubercle. Ah. Okay. So that's the modified part of the hinge. Uh, yep, yeah, talk about it. So, and that's a nice scan showing jaw closed, jaw fully open on the precipice of this location. Okay. Hasn't yet. Has to go past that edge but can happen with a blow, a punch, you can fall asleep and relax, muscles totally relax, and if you have a loose jaw, then they'll just look. So here's another figure, and these are the little cartoon ones. I like to put them in, and I encourage you to go to the web and type in temporal mandibular joint and look at all the images, because that might help you. Just remember the gold standard is whatever more it says is going on, not somebody else's book. But Hollings had this nice functional book, and it gives you nice in images of the size of the disc and how the thing moves, and they actually describe it really well. So, normal jaw movement, full movement, involves this translation. 
and it, it basically involves a disc in the middle. Symmetry is important. Some people, if you notice, and they close their jaw, the jaw might go to one side or the other. They may not have symmetry. So it's the first thing you check if someone's had an impact, is there, is there any kind of thing that's happened to the jaw that shifted it out of whack? And as both to close it, it should come up perfectly symmetrical. The thing, three finger test is full depression of the jaw. You should be able to get at least three fingers in there. If for some reason in the lab you, you're depressing your jaw and you can only get two in, don't try to put three in. Let's just say it's probably limited or something. And, I don't need dislocation. TMJ syndrome is a chronic pain syndrome. It's nasty. Balls muscles around this joint getting out of whack. There are physiotherapists who denigrate their career to treating TMJ. It's a very painful thing. Okay, the four muscles you have to know. Temporalis, master, the lateral pterygoid we talked about briefly, and the medial pterygoid. Some people say pterygoid, some say the pterygoid. I kind of do both. Uh, that's how you spell it. And it's easy to get these where they run in the lab, so I encourage you to take advantage of it if you haven't already. Temporalis, big area of its proximal attachment, if you wish, is from the temporal, temporal fossa. Big fan-shaped muscle. See the fibers here? They run anterior. These run down. These run slightly posterior. But a big attachment area. And if you feel it, you're chewing, it kind of pops out, okay? It's a big, strong muscle, and depending what species you are, you're all humans, but horses, things they chew a lot, you can see how big the temporalis is on them. It's quite thick, so it's very strong. It passes behind or deep to the zygomatic arch. So in this image, they cut the arch out of the way. So you're gonna see as it comes down, and lo and behold, what is it insert on the coronoid process? That process looks like a shark fin that comes off the mandible. The reason this process is there is because you have this big muscle joining the mandle and chronic, chronically pulling on it. That's where you get processes. Processes are enlargements that come out of a bone, usually because a muscle is attached to pulling on it, or a ligament, or there's wear and tear involved between other bones. So processes, a lot of them you're going to see in the body, are due to a muscle attachment. And this one, this is the prime elevator of your jaw, closing your jaw. Okay. Yeah. They do, but it's still there, because even in the womb, when you're bored, stiff, and you haven't popped out yet, there are a lot of jaw movements that occur. It'll get better and better, and it does seem to atrophy a bit with age. Those go down and down. Um, so, temporalis elevates the jaw. Posterior fibers here at the back, the way they come down and insert onto the coronary process, here's a better image of them. If your jaw was protruded, or if I start to talk to you, forward, okay, trying to pull will help to retract the jaw. So it does actually help with retraction of the jaw, pulling it back in. Masseter, Tom Cruise muscle, Top Gun, he's getting really pissy, doing this, this big bulge thing right here, that's his masseter, okay? And it's easy to see on the outside of everybody, there's two parts to it, but the main attachment is from the zygomatic arch, part of the zygoma and maxilla comes down and it attaches directly onto the angle of the mandible. So this line of pull again will facilitate elevation. So when you're really chewing hard, you can see that muscle popping out on each side. That's mastery. The other two are harder to visualize. This is why I encourage you to go to the lab, take the skull and turn it upside down and find the lateral pterygoid plate. The little fang of a bone that sticks out. But it gives origin to both of these, attack, this proximal attachment to both the lateral and medial pterygoid. We'll do the medial one first. So, the last figure on the side here, what they've done is they sort of cut out part of the ramus of the mandible and they got rid of the zygomatic arch. So, you can actually see the line of the medial pterygoid muscle. So, it runs from deep inside, close to your palate, out, and it turns on the medial side of the angle of the mandible. It's basically the deeper version of a masseter. They both have the same line, one's on the outside of the mandible, the other's on the inside of the mandible. And that means this one also, if you activate it, what's it gonna to wanna to do? Elevate and close the jaw. So that's three muscles now, that you're talking about, that are involved in slamming your jaw shut. That's why you're so strong at closing your jaw. 
You rely on gravity and a few tiny muscles to open your jaw. So you're much weaker at opening and closing your jaw. Question. Yeah, um, since uh, the master is attached to like the angle of the mandible, yep. why isn't it considered a process? Why isn't it considered like a process? Cause yeah, that's line of pull. So the way it pulls, it actually grabs the angle and pulls it this way. If it was done, attached maybe on the inside or attached to the coronary process, it would help to grow the process. It's right across the bone and it's pulling this way. There's a whole thick side of bone there, so there's no need for that. There's a ridge there. Uh -huh. You look at the angle of the mandible, you notice right at the angle it gets a little thicker. Let's well, get the master on the outside, the medial, turbo on the inside, and pulling on it. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to develop the process because you're pulling right across the bone. There's no need. Okay? The lateral pterygoid is harder to envisage, envisage. And again, I, I encourage you to go to the lab and look at it in the skeleton. But it goes in a horizontal plane, so it runs backwards. Again, the superior part attaches to the disc in your jawbone, your joint, the temple and your joint. And the inferior part grabs the, the, basically the neck of the mandible. So it would pull forward. This one, obviously, would help to protrude the jaw, to pull it forward. So if you do that, if you activate it, it will pull it forward. The problem is, the lateral pterygoid is not strictly in the sagittal plane. It's at an angle. And that's because where it attaches to this plate is closer to the midline than your jaw joint. So it actually runs that way, bilaterally. Okay, so if you activate both of them, both of the lateral pterygoids, they pull your jaw forward. If you activate one of them, this side, it's going to pull the, the mandible, the mental part of the mandible, forward but to the other side. Left side, jaw the other way. So this one, because of its line of pull, can cause that yaw, it's called movement of this plane, yawing, or shifting of the jaw. And that's what a cow needs. He needs to open his jaw, get the thing doing it, right? Rotate. So the molars come together, they can grind their grass. Same for you if you're eating something that needs to be ground by the molars. You use these muscles to help shift the line and pull the jaw. So lateral pterygoid, superior part will pull the disc forward, inferior part will pull the jaw forward if it's acting unilaterally, pull it to the other side. Yep. Mm -hmm. You have to speak really loud so they can hear you too. Yeah, so the again, superior one? Superior attached to the disc, they pull the disc forward. Pull the neck of the mandible forward. If they're acting bilaterally, straight, unilaterally, deviation to the other side. All four of these, you have to know the nerve supply of all these muscles. This one is the mandibular nerve. That's it. You don't have to know anything more. Than that. However, paralysis of the mandibular nerve on one side, you lose all four of these. What would you get? It's like jaw deviation, weakness on depression of the jaw, a lot of really inappropriate movements. So, geez, that took a long time. Uh, the spine, which is what we're supposed to be doing today. A vertebra, which you'll have next week. Basically, 33 bones. Some of them grouped together, the sacrum is a fusion of five. Caustic to rudimentary tail is usually three or four fused together. But then the other ones, lumbar, there's five of those. Thoracic, there's 12 of those. And cervical, there's seven of those. They're all stacked on top of each other. They're not fused. Well, unless you've had surgery to fuse them. They're not fused. That means there are joints, tons and tons of joints between all of these things. And it's because of that that you have quite a bit of mobility in your back. Okay. So you learn, you'll learn them. So instead of the cervical one, it's C1, the C7. Thoracic, there's 12 of them. You'll notice that something key happens in this area when we get the rib cage. They all articulate with ribs. Cervical region doesn't, unless it's a pathology. Lumbar, there's five of those, there are no ribs. But if you also notice, you go from top to bottom, they get progressively bigger. Why? Because they're la adding brick upon brick upon brick of weight. So the cervical region, they start to tuck out a bit because you're holding your head up. 
As you get into the thoracic region, they slowly get bigger as you go down to T12 because you're stacking weight on top of that from the upper body. And then when you get to the transition between L5 and S1, that's basically carrying your trunk and everything above it. So you get a progressive growth in the bone. And you're gonna learn in the lab, there are certain characteristics about cervical, thoracic, and lumbar that are very, very distinct from the other regions. You may never be able to tell me what T7, T8, or T9 are if I gave you three of them. You might not be able to tell the difference between them. But if I gave you T6, thoracic vertebrae, and I gave you something like the C4 vertebrae, you should be able to tell them immediately is what they are. I'll tell you why. Okay? If you notice, that's not a straight line. There are curves to the spine. And initially, when you're in mom's tummy, you have a pronounced curve. It's called a, uh, I'll come back to it. A curve like this, okay? So there's the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx here. It's a giant C. That's what the fetus is all curled up. It's gonna fit in there somehow, right? You pop out, and at the end of life, or as you get into being a kid, you'll develop another curve in the cervical region, in the lumbar region, it's actually the different direction than the thoracic. So we retain this kind of curve. There are joints in here. There are foramen in between the different vertebrae we'll talk about. There's a disc in between every vertebra. Remember that symphysis, the secondary cartilaginous disc, fibril disc, that goes between the bodies of the vertebrae. We talk a lot about that. They're in there. And then there are joints at the back on the other side of the spinal canal, where the bones articulate directly, called psychopopticeal joints. We'll talk quite a bit about those. So, you think of the spine, you can have these, this is the anterior view, this is the side view, showing you in the cervical region, and then again in the lumbar region, a different kind of curve called lordotic curve. The original C curve is a kyphotic curve. Okay. This developmental curve occurs Kids lying on his stomach, bored stiff, right? Mom's put me this way. Why is mom put me this way? Well, I can see the carpet. What do I try to do? I pick my head up. And the first stage of development of a little kid is they learn how to hold their head up, even lying down. With that, you get a progressive increase into lordosis of the C spine that'll stay with you for the rest of your life, hopefully. Then you're sitting. Remember how kids sit when they're six weeks old? They come up like a little Buddha. All kyphotic except for this lordotic neck curve. Eventually, when they start to walk, what happens? Lumbar spine goes into lordosis, and you develop this part. And in the end, you kind of line up the, the center of gravity right through the spine, and it can hold everything. So these curves are secondary to development. They can become a problem. You can get profound kyphosis, right? a real hunching of the back, sometimes called Dowringer hump. Something like this. Well, what says they're walking along, like they drop the contact or they're looking for corners. It's because there's a profound kyphosis. This happens a lot with osteoporosis with aging. You can also have a lateral curve to the spine called scoliosis. It's a bit of a problem. It's more pronounced in young girls, 12 to 15, just around the time of puberty. You can end up with a lateral bend. Okay. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. So what you're going to know is you're going to understand these curves, but you're also going to understand the spinal nerves that come out each level, because the spinal nerves are doing what? Coming together to form nerves that innervate all the muscles. So we're going to spend a bit of time just talking about how the spinal nerves get out of here. Because they will end up innervating all the muscles you're going to learn. Okay? And you're going to understand the movement. So a big part of the lab is to look from cervical to thoracic to lumbar to see what the areas are really able to do. We know the spine is really flexible, right? It's really flexible. But it's flexible in different directions in different areas. Because there's 25 of these independent vertebrae with this in between them, there might be a little bit of movement at each level. Across the whole thing, there might be a lot. Okay, so that's part of the lab, is really understand the movement of these segments to each other. And here's a blue box for more, again, out of interest. Or a really clear image of scoliosis. And what happens with scoliosis can be bone development, the body of one vertebra might be smaller on that on one side versus the other. It can be muscular, more common. 
where the muscles on one side of the back that you learn about are more tense than the ones on the other side, you end up causing a bend. And not just a bend, a rotation. So what happens is the spines of these different vertebrae start to rotate into the side and become cavity. Can be fixed with surgery, rods and things. It can also be fixed with some interesting therapy. And recent work, a couple years ago, suggested that an imbalance in your inner ear, the vestibular system, one of my interests, is partially the cause for this. You get too much vestibular input on the muscle from this side versus that side, it causes the rotation. So, scoliosis is an example of rotation. Here's again an excessive kyphosis. And you get an excessive lordosis when pregnancy, right? Over nine months, a huge mass starts to develop in front of the woman. And what you compensate for that by allowing a slight increase in the lower doses in the lower back. That's why a lot of end-stage pregnancies are completely chronic with the lower back pain. This big mass in front of it. So, individual vertebra have parts. They all have these parts. This is from more five, but I'm going to show you the more six picture in a second. But you can think about the parts having a function. The big purple part is kind of kidney bean shaped, so this would be a lumbar vertebra. Or it's body weight. These bodies are stacked one on top of the other. That means whatever mass is coming through, weight is coming through one, is being shoved onto the next one, primarily through this root. So it's supporting your body weight. There's an arch. This vertebral arch is in red, and it's basically designed to stick out behind the body and then wrap itself around this whole vertebral canal with a spinal cord. So the part of this isn't just to stand you up is to provide shielding for the continuation of the central nervous system. You learned about the first part of the brain. Out of the brain comes the spinal cord down into the body. This canal is designed to protect it, to protect the spinal cord from damage. So that part would be the red part. The blue parts, it's hard to see because they're coming out of the screen and going down in the screen, but these are articular processes. They actually reach up and reach down to grab the vertebra above and below them. So they help to kind of lock the thing together. So you're going to have a joint between the bodies, up and, up and, up and down, but you're also going to have these articular processes connecting up and down. So those zygopophyseal joints are connected. The green ones, transverse process and spinal process, they stick out quite a bit. Why? Because ligaments attached to them, and a whole lot of muscle attaches to them. And if you get a muscle that attaches way up here and it's pulling, it's going to be much more effective than it attaches close to midline. Okay? It has a lever arm. These processes allow you to have more strength. That's why the coronary process is so big and way in front of the center rotation of the jaw. Now it's a big, strong muscle closing your jaw. Okay? These are the functional parts you'll find on pretty well every vertebra. Here's a more picture. It's the same thing. These just color them slightly differently. If you go to the top figure, there's a breakdown in some of the, of the names. I put these in boxes for me. All this stuff is important. Everything on this slide you should know. Okay. If you think of the vertebral canal or vertebral foramen, that's surrounded by the arch. And the arch consists of pedicles, which are bones that stick off the body and go backwards, posteriorly. And it's hard to see here, but there's kind of a flange or a flat bone on either side called the lamina. So pedicles go up and the lamina come together. And the two of those on either side will form the arch that protects the canal and the orifice the vertebral frame. The body itself, part of the body in the middle part, as it grows in a fetus to, to you, an adult, it starts as cartilage. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the body, it starts to calcify into bone and then it grows up until it finally takes over the whole body. So that's endochondral growth. And you should, I hope, learn about that in the bone growth. But just on the outside, here and here, it's called an epiphyseal rim. So it's a different kind of bone, and it's heavily attached to the intervertebral disc that sits on top of it. So the slight difference in the body is the main part, and then there's this funny rim on the outside, which the disc is directly attached to. In life, this surface is going to be covered with hyaline cartilage itself. So the interesting thing about these bodies they rely, the bone in there relies on seepage of fluid into the bone and out. There's no direct blood supply to some of the bones. I don't know what else. A 
side view, you can now start to see parts like you see the spinal process, the transverse process to either side. Here, the transverse process on the right side is coming out of the screen at you. There's the body. You can see it's not just a square, it's kind of thicker at the top and at the bottom. And there are notches. There's a superior vertebral notch and an inferior vertebral notch as the pedicle goes back. If you stack them on top of each other, which is the below image, put a disc in between, the inferior notch on one side above and the superior notch of the disc of the vertebra below, now you get a hole or a frame. So they're called notches when it's just an individual vertebra, but as soon as you stack it to the disc in between, there's a frame. And this is critical because it allows spinal nerves to leave the spinal cord and exit between these bones. We'll talk about that next time. Lastly, it's a better view for you to see these articular processes. There's a superior one and an inferior one. Again, a process meaning it's an outpouring of bone, and one goes up and one goes down on either side. And when you smack the bones together, you can see how the inferior one of the one above will not interface with the superior one of the one below at an angle. And you'll see when you get into the lab, that angle is critical in allowing how much movement occurs at the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar region. These interfaces of this joint change, and they allow different kinds of movement to occur. On the very surface of these processes, you'll find a facet, meaning the area that's going to be covered with hyaline cartilage that allows this inferior part of this vertebra to then articulate the superior one below. So the process is the outpouring of bone on the surface that interacts with the other bone is going to be cartilage. That's the facet. That's why they're commonly called facet joints. So I can pop a seal, it's the whole mouthful. Facet is what I'll probably use all the time. So every vertebral interaction, there's going to be a facet on the right and left side on the, on the superior surface interacting with a facet of the vertebra above. Only specialized when we get to the skull and the sacrum. Okay? Uh, come back. So, part of it is you should be able to look at a cervical vertebra and go, okay, it's got some very characteristic things about it that tell me it's cervical, not just in size. Thoracic, things change. Okay, there's articulations for ribs, for example. And lumbar, they start to get really big, but they also change. So, all that typical stuff is still there, just how it looks is going to change. I'll spend a little more time on the cervical ones out of interest, but you should be able to, if you saw a typical cervical vertebra, you look at that, and you look at the one below, which is thoracic, you go, they don't look the same to me. There's some interesting differences. First off, your typical cervical vertebra, it's fine, but it's still bifid process. It's split. It means in this case, the bone wasn't pulling directly back in the spine. In fact, if the muscle wasn't pulling back in the spine, there are two muscles, and they're pulling in a different direction on the spine. Hence why it becomes bifid or forked. The other thing you notice is there's a hole in the transverse process, a big hole or frame called the transverse frame. That's because in the cervical region, a very important artery that supplies the back part of your brain with the vertebral artery goes up in that side. So that hole in the bone helps protect the artery and get from basically your trunk into the base of your brain. So, but it's distinct. You'll never find that in a thoracic or a lumbar vertebra. Okay. You look at the facet surfaces, they kind of, the superior one is pointing superiorly and posteriorly, the inferior one is pointing anteriorly and inferiorly. Well, that's very different to the line of the facets in the thoracic region, which are almost facing forward and backward. As you go down from the cervical to the thoracic, you notice the body starts to get bigger. The canal itself changes. It goes from being big and triangular in the cervical region to kind of circular in the thoracic region. The body, tiny and kind of oval in the cervical region, becomes almost what they call heart shaped, an inverted heart in the thoracic region. Transverse processes become very pronounced in the thoracic region. Why? Because they have to articulate with the ribs. Spinal process, again, you lose the bifidity, that's a word, I don't know how they get created it. And the spine itself comes way back and is big, but look at the angle it takes. 
go way down. So in the thoracic region, the tip of, let's say this is the T6 spine, it's actually the opposite of the body of the T7 vertebrae. When you're palpating the spine in the middle of your back, the body is an inch of it above. You push right through, you get the body of the next vertebrae because of the design. So these are the kind of things you're going to look at in the lab to get, uh, figure out. But if you go finally to the lumbar region, the body gets looks kidney shaped, the foramen starts to look triangular, and these articulating processes change dramatically. Not only does the body get big, but look at the spine. It went from being this pointy, sharp thing that descended down to flat. It's like a scale. It's a big flat thing that sticks out backwards. It's like a wing. It must be for attachments. It must be important for that. And the facets again change direction compared to thoracic. So I don't spend a lot of time in here, but you should spend a lot of time in the lab comparing them. We'll have a variety of thoracic, cervical, lumbar vertebrae. You should be able to look at them and generally tell me that's a lumbar, that's a thoracic, that's a cervical. There are a few atypical uh, ones that we'll talk about specifically next. There, other than the x-ray, where it's just there to show you all the bits and pieces, they'll never give you an x-ray to ask me to label something like that. That would be unfair. So all this other stuff would be fair game. Okay, we talk about it, but we will. And what I've done here is I've shown you the cervical vertebrae stacked one on top of each other. You sort of see how the spine get progressively bigger. Uh, Spinal processes, the lamina and pedicle we talked about. Uh, just the column of the, of the articular surfaces is okay. But when you get to C1 and C2, C1 is called atlas. Why? Atlas supports what? Your noggin, the skull. Think of atlas holding the world up in Greek mythology. So atlas or C1 are interchangeable. And C2 is another one that's different. C2 is different, and it's called axis. Uh, atlas axis, and then all the other cervical vertebrae are just three, four, five, six, and seven. But one and two are distinctly different, and that's because it allows you to rotate your head. This pivot joint that we introduced you to in the first real class is between C1 and C2. So, top down view here again is a typical cervical vertebrae, a bifid spine, there are your superior facets, the transverse process with a big hole in it, foramen trans, uh, trans, transversal, or transverse foramen. And then the transverse spine actually has a posterior and anterior tubercle, two little bumps that stick out. And they actually don't just stick out, they kind of, there's a bit of a groove here. Why? And again, that's where the spinal nerves are gonna come up from. And the body, it's hard to see here, and you'll see it better in a second, maybe here it's a little better to see. The top part, it's not flat. It's kind of cupped. It has these wings on either side. So it's not a flat surface interacting, it's a bubble. In fact, if you look at these two together, you can't really see it. It's a bowl on one side, and then it's con concave on the bottom to fit in with the next bowl below. So it has very distinct anatomy. And there are a couple of other things that are important. Uh, these joints are going to talk about specifically called uncle vertebral joints. You can actually see how the, the, the body here has this bowl shape to it, and then the bottom part is rounded to fit into the bowl below it. And it creates a very interesting situation of stability. If you've got a bowl stuck into another bowl, if you wish, you can't move them sideways, right? These ridges on either side are going to prevent let's say C3 and C4 sliding on top of each other. They won't allow it. So lateral dis dislocation of the cervical vertebrae is almost impossible. It won't go that way. It's built in such a way that you can't translate it in a, in a, in a chrono plane. And that joint we're going to talk specifically about. C6 has a little bump called the carotid tubercle. It only occurs on that one. It's because where the carotid artery bumps up against it. I have never seen a clear old bone, real bone, with a mark clearly. Okay, so it's just an anecdote. It's, it is going to make it distinct for C6, but you don't have to know it. Oh, transition. So, if you look down on C1, Atlas, you notice A, it's got really wide transverse processes. It does have this 
Trenbridge uh, foramen. And you also notice it has two sort of lateral masses, but it doesn't have a body. Oops. So C1 doesn't have a body to the vertebra. Instead, it has a posterior arch with a little tubercle in the back and an anterior arch with a little tubercle in the front. And then this circular area, and in real life, there's a ligament that goes right across here of the transverse ligament of that one. So the body, the moose, because it's migrated down and joined up with C2. So C2 actually owns the body of C1. But if you notice, this is quite pronounced. These two lateral masses and then the transverse process. You go to your own head, find your mastoid process, okay, just below your ears, and you push, Move your jaw around, it's not that. There's a solid bone there. I love it. I wish I had a picture to tell you what what's your goldfish. That's hard, isn't it? That is a transverse process on the left and right sides of C1. That's pretty big, don't you think? That's huge. But you can palpate C1. And if you hold it, <laughs> it's like a pushing up this one. You just do simple rotations of the head. It goes with your fingers, doesn't it? It's not leaving the skull. It's attached tightly to the skull. So this rotation is basically C1 and where it articulates with the skull moving together. Okay. About 30 degrees, left and right. So 60 in total. When you go, no, Tim, I don't understand anatomy. That is all movement between C1 and C2. The skull those condyles at the bottom of the occipital bone articulate here on the superior articular facets of C1. So C1 interacts with the skull, and you can palpate. You can feel the posterior tubercle, because if you go down the back, you find the external occipital protuberance. You go down even deeper, you find that kind of groove between muscles on either side. Deep, deep in there would be the posterior tubercle. So you cannot palpate the buried in tissue of the muscle. It doesn't really stick out for C2 from above, different shape again. We start to acquire this bifid spine, or fork spine. There's a nice area for the lamina. There's your vertebral foramen. Remember the spinal cord at this exit of the skull has to come down through here. There's an inferior facet pointing the other way into the, into the screen, and the superior facet. And the superior articular facet is going to articulate with what? <coughs> Base or inferior facets of C1. And if you look in the middle, it doesn't really have a body, although you could say it doesn't have a body, but it has this other structure called the dandro-gonfin process. And I'll show you a picture in a second. That's coming way out of the screen at you. That's the body of C1. And it's been welded and grown into C2. And that's where the pivot all occurs between that action. Close. So here's the two of them together. Here's C1 and C2. And you can see how, although the body's gone from here, the dandrodontic process sticks up and goes in between the anterior arch and that ligament I showed you. It creates a pivot, a pivot joint. And in this case, you have the two lateral maps labeled as A, the dandrodontic process is D. You have two joints. You have the medial atlantoaxial, atlas axis joint, right in the middle. That's the pivot joint, right? But to allow that to happen, these lateral joints, these lateral lentil occipital joints, you basically have to have these two surfaces do what? Slide on each other. So if you look at the surface, these facets, they're almost horizontal. Great. That means it's real easy to slide. That means it's real easy to get that 30 degrees of rotation left and right. So literally what happens is this pivot around the middle, and then these two facets that's big, they glide across each other. And you allow all that movement to occur between you see one and that's where all that occurs with simply saying no. Uh, this is through your mouth, so you can actually see the dense process. Sometimes we'll do this x-ray if we're worried about it being fractured. You want to hang someone, you hang them properly, you fracture right there. So you break the dens, you make the joint fall on the stage. Um, again, here are images that were from the least more. It's the same three that I just showed you, including the types of and I encourage you to look at how they interact. Basically, the dens below is going to stick up right through this hole. And then you have a ligament on the back that basically allows the whole thing to pivot around that surface. 
On these surfaces here, the insecure ones on the, on the C2, flat, and interact with the base, which are big facets in the bottom of C1, and they can glide on each other. Okay, image from more, just showing you the progression. Uh, and again, it's all the same kind of stuff from C1 to C7. As you get to C7, you start to get a really big spine, and it's hard to tell the difference between what's C7 and what's C1. In fact, I never will, because I can't tell the difference. The upper thoracic kind of look like C7, kind of look a lower cervical. It's not until you get down a few in the T4 and T5, the spine starts to drop and you go, ah, that's a classic thoracic vertebra. There's only one way, and that is T, T, T1 will have the sets on the transition process for a rib. But I wouldn't expect you to get that. Okay? I'm spend just a bit of time on this. Intervertebral discs, so these are the secondary cartilaginous joints are synthesized. And at this, it's, it's primarily connective tissue that has two parts. There's an annulus fibrosis, or a ring of connective tissue on the outside, and then a jelly filling called the nucleus pulposus. In a baby or a young kid that's been born, it's about 85% water. In an old part like me, we're down to probably 15% water. So with age, and continual pounding with, with time and weight and gravity. The discs can stiffen, they can become uh, less fluid if you wish, but in a young person, think of this as a fluid-filled disc. And if you didn't have the intervertebral discs, you'd be about three quarters of your height. So vertical height in the spine, three quarters of that is due to the size and thickness of the bodies of the vertebra, and one quarter is these little pillows you put in between each of these vertebrae. So when you get up in the morning, you're a good quarter inch taller than when you went to bed at night. Why? Because as you sit there and load your discs all day, it pushes water out of the disc, and you're about a quarter inch shorter when you go to bed. You go to bed, gravity's off, and the disc reinflates if you wish with fluid. Now as you age, you get 30, 40, 50, that process is called inhibition when the water is put back in the discs goes down. Again, I've actually been measuring myself at night. You might think it's weird. I don't change height during the day. So my, my discs don't be inflated. In fact, chronically now, I'm a good quarter to a half inch shorter than I was when I was in high school. And that's common too. Before my dad died, he was 6'2. And I remember before he died, he and I were almost high level. He had shrunk so much, his spine had compressed, and he was so kyphotic that it was hard to believe it was the same guy. Yep. They're creating artificial discs, but it's really difficult. Um, the solution is when the disc gets so bad, you just fuse the bodies around the disc together. It's called spinal fusion. Not that good. So all the other parts we talked about, but you can see how the spinal cord reside into this vertebral area. The uncle joints only occur in the cervical spine, that's why I want to talk about them. And it's because of this shape, this funny little shape, convexity, and I encourage you to look in the lab at them. So it runs like a bowl, one below, and the base of the bowl, one above. And on the sides, and usually closer to the posterior aspect of the bodies, you have these ridges. And there's a joint space in here. Some people argue it's a snowmobile joint, some people just think it's some kind of reminiscent byproduct. You still have a disc, you still have the annulus fibrosis, the nucleus pulposus in the middle, but you have this kind of grooved thing. And again, if you think about it, it would be really hard for you to push one verbal body laterally on the other because it just would have butt against the bone. So in the cervical spine, this is good, right? This kind of lateral translation is incredibly difficult to do. The only reason I can do that is you get a little bit of movement in each one. And you're doing the whole Egyptian thing, that's It's not a pure translation. It doesn't allow that to happen. And so these joints, are only seen in the verbal area and it's because of their bodies. A few ligaments we're going to start, we're going to finish in the next class. Here again is your intervertebral disc with the nucleus in the middle and the rings of the annulus fibrosis. We're going to talk a little bit more about its mechanics. One thing I will point out, if it's a jelly donut, as an example, jelly part is closer to the back of the disc than it is to the front. It's not right in the middle. It's closer to the canal. Where they cut through. So it's prone to perhaps herniating or moving backwards. 
And when you actually have the gel go into the spinal canal or protrude into the spinal column, that's a herniated disc. And that's where I'm going to pick up the next slides. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The three ligaments you should know running along the front of the anterior bodies of all the vertebrae from the sacrum all the way to the skull is the anterior longitudinal ligament. Notice it spans the whole front. So it's a big, broad ligament. It's fairly thin, but it's big, and it's powerful. Posteriorly, on the inside of the canal, right up against the, the posterior aspect of the body, so not on the other side of the canal, but right along the inside, it's a posterior longitudinal ligament, and it runs the same course, from the base of the sacrum all the way up to the base of your spine. The difference here is, look, it's not very wide. But it helps to anchor and support the inside of the body together, but it's not very wide. It doesn't cover the whole back. Last one, these are we'll describe it more, by the way. Ligament and flavum is a yellowish ligament that runs between the lamina. So what they've done is they've cut the body away of these two vertebra right through the pedicles to show you the lamina. And joining these together all the way up is another ligament. The difference with this one is kind of yellowish on a cadaver because it's not really thick collagen, it's actually elastic tissue. So as you bend forward, and you try to pull these lamina apart, they will separate a bit. This thing is gonna try and prevent them separating too much. But actually when you go from, I hope I don't get stuck. When you get down here, the first part of you going back up, you're just relying on the energy reserves of that elastic ligament to help you extend. So as you go down into a full flexion of the trunk, these are really loaded with energy, they will help you come back up. So read these three and then carry on reading the rest of the ligaments because this is where we're going to pick up all the ligaments in the spine. One question, wait, hang on, question. So, um, are the, where are the facets in like, relative to this diagram? So, if you were to uh, dig out here, you would find the facet joints. So the facets are on the side okay. and then in, right here is the flavor. Wide, yeah. arch, Oh. Yeah. I think the facets are like where they 